<laughs> Finally, long journey. Thought, Good to meet you. I thought if we ever met, you'd be the star and I'd be coming to you. <laughs> You're the star. You're the star. <laughs> What's up guys, I have a very special video for you today. It's basically gonna have two main components. One will be an interview with a pioneer from the MMA industry here in China, and we're gonna find out a little bit more about the sport here. And the second is an entire MMA event, and it's gonna be a pretty special one. It has fighters from all over China, including Kazakhs from Xinjiang, and actually Kazakhs from Kazakhstan as well. And the main fight is gonna be between a young Tibetan fighter and one of China's most experienced MMA fighters, a ethnic Mongolian from Inner Mongolia. Uh, but first of all, we have to get ourselves from Beijing to Chang'an in one of the southernmost areas of one of the southernmost provinces of China, nestled right up against the Myanmar border. Our journey will require trains, planes, automobiles, and even bicycles. So without further ado, let's get on the road. <laughs> Good to meet you. I thought if we ever met, you'd be the star and I'd be coming to you. <laughs> You're the star. You're the star. <laughs> All right, here we are on the morning of fight day in Tangyan County, Lintang City. And we're about to find out a little bit more about the fights, uh, about the MMA uh, kind of uh, whole system in China. Um, and uh, Anderson is going to walk us through that. Now, I've had a previous warning from uh, our mutual friend, Woody. He said, if I ask you to introduce yourself, um, you're going to severely underplay how important you've been to the industry here. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just say you were involved from, from being a fighter, to being a trainer, to being a recruiter, to being an organizer, now today being a, a, a presenter. So some pretty important stuff, and we're gonna dive into it a little bit more. But first things first, let's go and get a coffee. Great. All right, let's go. All right, here we are, as I said, the morning of the fight day. Uh, but before we go into actually seeing any fights, we're gonna learn a little bit about MMA in China and what exactly is going on here. So I guess maybe a good place to start, especially for people who understand something about MMA, that's not me, but maybe you can explain for everybody else, like what's the difference? Is there any difference between MMA in China and MMA overseas? Well, the sport itself is more or less the same. Um, the, the rules, the judging criteria, um, 
the action. It's more or less the same. Um, but the lifestyle and the path for the athlete in China to reach the professional level is quite a bit different than it is outside of China in the places that I've been. Right. Um, for example, what I know about sports in the West is you will join a team, you will pay the fees to join, you will train your hardest, you will do your best in competition, and one day you might get to be able to train for free, you might become a pro, um, and you know, good luck to you. A lot of guys really suffer, um, you know, washing dishes or flipping burgers or whatever, training when they can, and, um, and, and they still make it, but it's a lot of hard work. Uh, here in China, the MMA teams need to compete with the sports university system, which doesn't exist in Canada and um, probably doesn't exist in a lot of places outside of China. Um, the sports university system is a university that spe specializes in sports, uh, Olympic sports specifically. Um, but all, there are also some other sports such as Sanda, which is like Chinese kickboxing, which are included in the sports university system. So these universities, um, athletes will join the team, uh, they'll live in a dormitory, they will eat in the cafeteria, they will train in a great facility with great coaches, there's physiotherapy, there's competition, and then when they're finished, they will um, uh, get a, a degree. And this degree is what I believe, it's, it's probably equivalent to an arts degree. So, um, you know, I wish I had this opportunity. If I, if I, if I could get a degree in boxing or, or, or judo or whatever, I'd, I'd be a PhD by now. Yeah, but now you have some experience with that system though, because you, you uh, basically entered MMA here in China. Did you join one of these kinds of uh, gyms that are competing with the universities? Yes, I did. Um, I came to Beijing first. Uh, to compete in 2007, and I lost that fight. Uh, that was my first loss, but I stuck around. Well, what number fight was that? How, how many fights had you had by that point? I, I was four and zero oh going into that fight, and when I left, I was four and one. Uh, but I stuck around Beijing for another three days, I think, and I watched uh, how my opponent uh, lived. And basically, his, his accommodation was taken care of. Uh, the food was prepared for him, and not only him but everyone else on the team so they had all the responsibilities of life taken care of for them and they could focus exclusively on getting better and resting and and i was like wow man this is this is this is a dream come true for me so i spoke to the the guy who ran the the show and sponsored the team and i told him that um you know i wanted to join the team uh, how, did you, how did you manage to convince him i mean you're the you're at that there were no other foreigners in the, on the team right well i thought it was a long shot you know like he 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 even told me he's like well it's you know it's a chinese team you know it's a little bit weird that you know there's this western dude like you know just grouped in with those guys so how did you, you get it well I, I i told him i said look man i i can speak a little bit of chinese i can translate for your brazilian coach that speaks english um but not chinese and um you need foreign fighters on your show, so you save money, man. You don't have to fly people in from overseas. I could just take, take uh, public transit to the show. Let's do it. And he, um, he surprisingly agreed to this setup. So I, I lived and trained um, with some of the best fighters in Chinese MMA history to date um, for a couple years. Right. And uh, it was a great experience for me. And, and my own level skyrocketed as well under that system. Uh, so... Um, the, the pro MMA teams, they have to compete with this sports university structure or else, you know, there's no way, if you, if you could just become a boxer or a judoka or a wrestler um, and, and have that nice cushy life, why would you flip burgers or wash dishes and race back and forth to gyms when you have free time? It's just right. not worth it, right? So uh, the life of the athlete in China is dramatically better, in my opinion, than anywhere else that I've seen. You know, you, you, you show up at the gym without a day of training. You say you want to be a pro. They say, okay, well, your free training is over here. Your free house is over here. And your free food is over here. Welcome to the team, right? It's, I mean, that, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, if, I mean, but if, if these kind of private uh, training centers have to compete with universities, um, from an economic standpoint, how, how does it work? Like, how do, they, how do they monetize that in the end? Do they build a team? Or like, what, what, what's going on there? There's, there's times when the professionals act as an uh, advertisement for a uh, recreational gym that um, 
uh, nine to fivers can can come in and, and train, you know, just for fun. Uh, but for the most part, the, this massive expense in uh, maintaining a professional team is uh, a financial loss to philanthropists that just want to contribute to the community. Oh, okay, so they're not really going into it saying that I'm doing this because I can make a bunch of money from it because it sounds like it's a bit difficult, but it's more that they want to contribute to the industry or to society, like what, yeah. Yeah, just basically charity, yeah. Wow. Um, there's, you know, there's times when fighters need to uh, uh, give a percentage of their winnings to the fight team. Yeah. But it, um, I don't think there's an example I can think of where that amount ever paid off the cost of developing them to that level. Because so, not all of them get to that level also? Or well, so well, well just, just the cost of maintaining a, a fighter, like your, your rent, your food, and your training with all the coaches and the rent of the facility, all this kind of thing, this is a significant amount of, of uh, money every month. A fighter just getting into the shows, you know, he might make, he might fight after one year of training, he might have a fight or maybe it won't be until two years. Uh, then he'll fight a couple times a year and he might make a thousand US dollars or um, even less, 5,000 renminbi or, or, or maybe eventually 10,000 and then, uh, better fighters like here in JCK, they're getting bigger payouts, but that comes l later in, in, in their career. Uh, so the first few years, you know, you, that, that's all accumulated and paying it back from deductions from fight purses years in the future um, oftentimes doesn't ever cover um, because the deduction is not big enough. Now, what, what, what about on um, a organizational level. So this organization, J, uh, J, JCK, JCK uh, the organization that's holding the fight that's going on right now. I mean, it's a huge stage they got going on. They got a pre-show that's going, I mean, it looks like there's a lot going into this. Now the fighters, they've got prize money and stuff like that, but even from an organization, is it, is it also something that is not really this big money-making enterprise yet? It's kind of like, it, 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 I'm just trying to understand the ecosystem. Okay. Well, the, yeah, philanthropy is a huge part of, of MMA worldwide, I, I believe, but all, in, this includes China. The show, um, you know, they, are, they have high uh, aspirations and they've done an amazing job of crushing it inside China. They're now looking to, to, to work. They've done, a, they've done a co promotion show in Armenia now and they're looking, they're looking to do other shows in, in places like Kazakhstan and other, other areas outside of China. So, um, yeah, but to, to build a sports league, uh, it takes time and it takes a lot of money. And um, uh, a lot of MMA shows don't survive long enough to make it to that level. Right. Um, you know, JCK started in 2019, 2019 and they've done, this will be their 86th show. Wow. All through COVID, just, they just powered through it. It's amazing what they've done. And the quality of their production is world class. You will see the fights yourself. Uh, you know, this, this event is at altitude. So I think the, 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 the energy level is going to fizzle out a little bit uh, if it gets into the further rounds. But I'm sure without a doubt, you will see some really exciting uh, first rounds. Right. Yeah, I can't promise second or third, but these guys are great athletes. And, and, I'm expect and, and especially the ones that are on tonight's card, they're world class. Now, now in terms of the industry, MMA industry in China itself, w would you say that it's still kind of in its infancy and there's a lot of room above? Like, uh, what, what are your thoughts in that regard? It's grown dramatically since I popped into the, the scene in 2007. MMA started, I believe, in China in 2005. Okay. And it was maybe just, a, uh, you know, the number of shows until I got there, you could count on one hand. Oh, wow. So um, you were right really early into this uh, scene. Yes. Um, and uh, now there's, especially, I, I've actually ch uh, did a chart of, all the shows in China over the, since the since it began, and the peak um, the peak was 2017. There was there was basically uh, two shows a, a week or something like that, and then it was rising again. And then COVID, of course, crushed everything except for JCK and maybe one or, one or two other shows that uh, yeah that just basically swallowed the entire market share of the domestic MMA events. Now that the in COVID has passed and the restrictions have uh, loosened. Now shows are, are rising again, but JCK has been consistent. They're doing three, 
about three shows a month. And, and they've, yeah, they've, you know, do the math. Since 2019, there was uh, some complications during COVID where they had to stop for a few months, but otherwise they powered right through the pandemic and, um, and they're still going strong. Now, I want to move into kind of the fights and the fighters a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you notice, for example, specific areas or regions or whatever it is from China produce uh, or have a reputation of producing tough fighters? Like, where, where are they coming from in China? Well, I have actually thought a little bit about this, and I've, I'm trying to kind of map where the toughest guys and the talent comes from. And it's, it's, it's too hard to say because there's, there's strong guys coming out of all, all corners of the country, but there are certain pockets, like in Canada, how there's hockey towns like Val d'Or in Quebec and Kamloops in BC, Peterborough, Ontario, that produce a, um, you know, a, a, a large percent, a disproportionate percent of the NHL stars. Um, and, and for fighting, there's also places like that here in China. Um, some of the places that are seem more obvious are um, uh, Tongliao in Inner Mongolia. Okay. Um, also, um, Yili in Xinjiang. Okay. Um, the province of Shandong is also has a lot of strong strikers. But those those places in northern China, the, the guys are big, and right. it's it's a it's like a very masculine, tough kind of culture mm. to begin with. But there's other parts of China that are less. Um, that also produce really good fighters that are, are less obvious. For example, Anhui province. Um, it's the only place, well, it's one of the only places in South China that produces um, uh, really strong fighters, especially kickboxers. Liu, Liu Kai, Lucas Liu, who's fighting in the co-main event tonight, is an amazing world-class fighter, and he is from Anhui. So you'll get to see what Anhui is all about in that co-main event tonight. Uh, another place in, two other places in South China, that are really uh, that, that produce a lot of strong fighters. One is Daliang Shan in Sichuan. Um, it's very very high in the mountains. I've been there, and um, uh, the ethnic group uh, that uh, is strongest in that area are the the E people. Okay. And um, we have an E fighter from Daliang Shan fighting tonight in um, also on the main card, Aping Shala, who is a very very exciting fighter. Uh, he's not that well known yet but he's really good you'll see him fight against a very tough kazakh fighter from kazakhstan okay. so that that's a fight to watch for is it the second last fight or third last, third last fight okay yeah. all right um you know i was asking about that because you know quite quite a while ago one of my friends from inside tibet uh, region the borders of the tibet autonomous region had once told me that a lot of tibetans from that area are intimidated by tibetans outside of tibet um, that they're kind of scary to them. And I, I, I wanted to, before I asked that question, I actually, a couple days ago, I asked one of my Tibetan friends from Qinghai. I said, hey, you know, a, a Tibetan friend inside Tibet told me this before. Is this, um, you know, a kind of misguided? Um, and he said, no, no, not misguided. It's a stereotype. I said, yeah, but is it a founded stereotype? He's like, a very founded stereotype. He said, specifically from Kham, you have... Um, you know, so Kham is the region of uh, northwestern uh, Yunnan, a little bit of it, Shangri-La area, western Sichuan and southern Qinghai, and um, kind of a mountainous area. And he said, yeah, they've, uh, the stereotype about them is being kind of killers and gangsters. They're really, really nice, but they'll, they'll kill you over something, you know, <laughs> small. Uh, whether that's an exaggeration or not, I'll leave that out. But, um, but he says definitely there is that uh, uh, perception. And so I guess that might not necessarily be an ethnicity thing per se, but like you were saying, different regions and maybe to do with their climate, their altitude, whatever it is, producing different kinds of fighters. I, I would not say that ethnicity per se has a, a large influence on, um, on whether or not a fighter will become successful as a, uh, in, in his career. But I do believe, like you said, the region is important. If you look at where the, the toughest fighters are, quite a few of them, regardless of ethnicity, come from fringe areas or more rural areas, right? Um, speaking of Kham, this area, yeah. uh, there's also another area in Sichuan called Abajo. And Abajo is also an ethnic Tibetan region that produces a lot of fighters, a lot of good fighters, including one of tonight's main event fighters, Zhu Wang. So is that the third, uh, second, main second event, main, main event, event, main event. So he's a Tibetan, 
Uh, and he's going up against... Uh, he's going up against Zhao Zikang, who's an ethnic Mongolian. Okay, so our final fight, our main fight, is going to be a um, Tibetan against an Inner Mongolia. And who, who has... Does one of them have more experience than the other, or...? Zhao Zikang is by far more experienced. Uh, Zhuang has 10 fights. He's only 21 years old. Uh, has been fighting professionally since he was 16 years old of age and uh, training full-time since probably 15. Right. And um, he's an amazing fighter. He's really tall with a long reach, fast and powerful. Uh, if, if he has one, well, what's his weakness? I, I think one thing that, it, that goes against him is his experience. Ten fights is a lot, but compared to Zhao Zikang, who has it, it's probably close to 40 professional MMA fights, plus twice as much in Sanda. He's a, he's a kickboxer. Oh, right. So he's, he's, he's also been training since he was 13 years of age, like full time. So even though this um, young Tibetan fighter is a good fighter, it sounds like he's kind of going to be the underdog in this. Definitely the underdog in this fight, but he's, he's beat tough guys before. This is just a huge step up in competition, so there's, there's no guarantee he'll lose. But he's definitely not fought anyone as good as Zhao Zikang. This will career. be the first time he's... Uh, that, this is going to be a really interesting fight to watch. How is he... Uh, does he seem to have like an understanding that he's going up against somebody pretty tough? Or what's his like mood attitude like? He's... he's you will see. He's very cocky. You know, and he's, he's great on the microphone. Uh, he talks a lot of smack uh, and he backs it up. Um, but I, I really... I, if I was his coach, I'd be very nervous because I, I expect him to walk into this fight very cocky, drop his hands. He sometimes does that, taunting his opponents. And, oh, he's done this in previous fights. Yeah. And Zhao Zikang will knock him out if he does that. I, I, I think uh, strategically, Zhuang can win this fight if he plays smart and kind of eats some humble pie, plays towards Zhao's weaknesses, which would be submissions. Right. If he can get the fight to the ground and work the submission game. He has a very good chance of winning, but is he? Zhao is very difficult to take down. Right. First of all, um, uh, and and secondly, I'm I'm just not sure Zhao Wang cares about. Like he he's he's so confident that he'll just play anyone's game and try to beat them at their own game. So right. that might get him into some trouble tonight. Right now, can you tell me a little bit about some of the other fights that we can expect uh, tonight? Well, another another fighter that's on the card that's quite exciting is uh, A Ting, who's a Thai guy. Uh, who's the only other non-Chinese guy I know, other than me, that's gone through the Chinese fight system this way. Um, so I saw him on the fight card and I messaged him. <laughs> you know, I said, what are you doing? We used to fight on the same card. You know, I've been retired for 10 years. And I'm like, you know, you're still fighting. What's going on? He's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a shot. So he hasn't fought for seven years, but he was a really good fighter. He's a, he's a Thai, uh, Muay Thai specialist, obviously. He's got, I think he's got 90 Thai fights. 90 Muay Thai fights, um, won most of them. He's done well in MMA too, and he's, he's even submitted uh, Jiang Lipeng, who's a UFC veteran. Other than the ma those four main card fights, the undercard is also exciting, but those fighters are lesser known. Right, okay, we've got a female match also. Right? Yes, a female match. Yang Qingqing is a, is a, a really uh, strong striker, but she's also very young. And her opponent, um, Jia Yu Rou, is making her MMA debut, so we don't know anything about her. Right. No, that's cool. Well, it's starting to get busy here and noisy, so maybe we'll continue finishing our coffee, and what we'll do after is we'll walk around and we'll talk a little bit about the town. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, this is my first time visiting this area. We're just five kilometers away from Myanmar. Right. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a faraway pocket of, of China that, that uh, I've never been to. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've discovered is that they grow coffee in this region. And what do you think of this coffee? It's great, right? Yeah, they've added something to it. What did they add? It was... Uh, it's called uh, Deng Gui, which, yeah, yeah. don't ask me what the translation is, but it's some kind of Chinese medicine. Yeah, some kind of Chinese herb or something like that. And I, I didn't expect I was going to enjoy it, but it's, it's pretty good, yeah. All right, well, let's finish our coffee and then have a walk around. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the guy that wants my job, huh? <laughs> oh, let's go. Let's go. Oh, man. How you doing? Oh, man. It's been way too long. How are you? 
good, good. I'm glad you made it here. Finally arrived. Oh. It, was a, it was a bit of a journey. I think I counted at like four flights either missed, canceled, or... Oh, it was crazy. Traveling sweat. It you missed days. 15 seconds. When you, when you reached the gate and you said, tell them to open the door, it was 15 seconds after we started you know rolling. Uh, if you, uh, I think I'd like to get a coffee to go, but let me say hi yeah. to this guy. Look at him. How are you doing? Look at you. Hey. Hey, look at you. Yeah, so, so the style and the beauty. All right, okay, so now, as you notice, we've got a third person with us, Woody. We go way back. We haven't seen each other for a few years. Also a fighter and uh, the... Uh, Retired fighter. Yeah, but you still got you still train people, right? Yep. And uh, the the uh, the coolest, toughest South African in Shenzhen, right? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll not agree, but I'll be happily. Yeah, you won't you, know, you won't I, dispute it. Either. Yeah, I won't I, 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 I won't say <laughs> that, but I won't dispute. It. <laughs> we thought uh, you were not going to make it here in time, and uh, you were supposed to be on the same flight as me, but because um, everybody was worried. They gave uh, your job to me, but then I found out I've got to fight you yeah. to take the job. <laughs> I agree. And because I, I don't really want to hurt you, so yes. I think I'm just going to give it back to you. Well, uh, you know, like, you know, but it is a formality. We might as well, we <laughs> might as well, you know, just go through the motions. I, of the I insist. I, you know what? No, 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 no. Then you know what? I insist. I insist. You yeah. take it. <laughs> now, uh, you just arrived. You've never been here before, right? No. This is a pretty cool little town, isn't it? You, you, you were walking around these little bars, and they're just kind of... What was it? Like Monday night and, and it's full of people in it. Well, I, I don't really know much about this town. I just know it's a small town, you, do, you know, almost walking distance from Myanmar. And um, that's all I know about it. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I, I love the way that, the, you know, the, the buildings are kind of modern, but they keep their like ethnic kind of, you can see the cattle heads put into this building over here and, right. and there's some sort of like a, like the, the lamp posts here kind of have a sort of tribal vibe to them. I it like does. it. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty clean city too. Uh, a lot going on. And uh, you, some of the locals showed up for the uh, rehearsal yesterday, right? This is one of the my favorite things. When, when I'm at shows somewhere far away like this, places where they've never even, you know, they, they heard about MMA like 15 minutes before they came to the weigh-ins yesterday. And they're just like, what's happening in our town, right? And you know, grandma and, and babies, are, they're all there. And just to see the look on their face when they're just like, what is going on? You know, guys from all over the world are gonna come and fight each other in a cage. <laughs> all the lights and sound. And it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things about going to MMA shows is seeing the reaction of the locals when they're introduced to right. MMA for the first time. It, it's such a cool place too though, like the vibe. Um, you know, when I, when I arrived in the airport, um, I'm walking around looking for the driver. Obviously he was a bit late, but the, the police officers came up to me. They said, oh, where, you know, where are you from? I said, I'm from Canada. They're like, yeah, but you look like us. And then, <laughs> you know, and then the, 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 the man Wadzu. Yeah, yeah, and then the manager of the airport said, okay, come, come, come. They, he sat down, he made tea for me. The manager um, of the airport. Yeah, the manager of the airport was talking. Cool. He had my WeChat. Um, he said, oh, you haven't eaten dinner yet. He went and bought some bread for me. Wow. Uh, when we were sitting down yesterday in the restaurant, the owner of the restaurant, the lady, she came. We, we were finished. We didn't want any more beer. She's like, oh, the next two beers are on me because she wanted to sit down with yeah. us and have a, you know, have a few drinks with us. Uh, just such a cool vibe here. Um, but it'll be interesting to see their reaction once the fights actually start and to see, like, you know, how amazing it is for them. Vaughn will actually know more about the details, but um, there's a lot of this air, this region produces a lot of the good fighters in China. Um, yeah, we were just talking about that. We were talking about the different regions and stuff like that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's such a small part, but Yunnan has quite a lot, um, like percentage wise. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's a uh, they don't have a huge population, right? And they have quite a few. Yeah, in terms of good, per capita, good fighters. Yeah, yeah. Here's this cool pedestrian mall. Um, it's, it's a quiet fun place to walk if you want to yeah, stroll yeah. up and down. I found that a lot of the places here seem to really kind of uh, come alive at night here. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm so shocked because the, the contrast between, um, you know, the quiet, simple, um, small town life during the day and the, the nightlife here is pretty crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of bars with, um, you know, I noticed a lot of international brand beers and stuff like that. Things that you... You would you would have a hard time finding um, 
a, play, a place with this much of a vibrant nightlife uh, in a city with millions of people. Right, yeah. yeah. One of the bars you, you took me by was uh, had a beer fridge with dozens of different kinds of beer and stuff like that. Definitely not something I would have uh, expected here. One thing I'm wondering is when you set these kinds of fights up in different places all around China, are there places that are kind of adverse to having you set up a, a fight in their town where they're just like, ah, nah, you know what, I don't know about this setting up a fight here or whatever? Sometimes, for sure, there's there's a concern. Sometimes there's a concern that, um, you know, the fighters are, you know, going to be beating people up on the street or, um, you know, it's 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 this kind of... But, but that, in fact, once they get a, a better understanding of, of what we're actually doing, they, they embrace it and, you know... In fact, when you think about it, martial arts is a uh, intangible Chinese cultural heritage, and it has a, it's a gift really that has been spread around the world and influenced uh, by peoples from all corners of the world. And now, martial arts, in its most modern form, which is MMA, is making its homecoming back to China, and it's it's welcome with open arms. Right, yeah, that's a good way to look at it in terms of having such a, a rich martial arts history. It makes sense that um, this would be something that, uh, that, that, that will be embraced and uh, could really grow here. But um, yeah, how about, we, uh, how about we head over to the venue and we talk a little bit more there. We see what's going on there. Uh, we get a chance to see the, the ring and everything like that in the daytime because obviously once the fights start, it'll be night. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, let's see what's going on there. Great. Cool. All right, let's go. All right, we're here at the venue taking a look at everything being set up. Looks good. I think the, the sound system, I think, is, is pretty good, eh? It's, um, it's, it's, um, Parrot. It's music concert grade good, um, but it will be put to the test tonight as it seems like there is a literal concert, like, 100 meters away from here. Right. Yeah, uh, so. yeah. I, when I was in the hotel, I thought that music was coming from here, and I'm getting out, I'm like, ah. And then it turns out this like Bob Marley music is being played by the locals <laughs> over there. Well, yeah. it, it's, it was all these reggae, reggae yeah. uh, music of some popular hits and all in English. And I've never impressive. heard that anywhere else in China. Was, you know, before I arrived, Woody told me that if I asked you to introduce yourself, you'd downplay yourself. And I'm constantly getting the, the, the that impression. This is like a level of Canadianness that you've held on to. But like here, the head referee for the last match, even he's like, oh, this guy gave me so many opportunities. So maybe Woody, you got to say something about this guy. What is, what is he? What is this guy for to the? The, the MMA industry here in uh, China. Well, I, I don't know all his credentials. I mean, he, he, he has to tell his own story when it comes to the exact details. But he um, was one of the pioneers in the start of MMA in China. He was part of that first crowd of people who was fighting, uh, both as a fighter and then he was also a very active coach. And after that, he also moved into a managerial position with like the talent scout. So he yeah. worked with all the gyms all over China. So you would well see networked. when we... Yeah, what you'll see now, not only do all the all the all the fighters normally look at him as a hello, An Lao Shi, which means like a teacher, yeah. teacher Anderson. Um, almost all the coaches, at some point of their career, passed under his tutelage. <laughs> most of the people you'll see who are coaching, or even the referees, because most of the referees are ex fighters. So uh, it, it it is it isn't an incredibly big network, but. Yeah, he's, he's been involved too. with that. He's a real like a pioneer. And then he's also, he fought in some big shows. He fought in Bellator, which fought all over, all over China, has some big wins. Um, he fought in, was it uh, K1? Yes. Yeah, he fought in K1, had a knock, he, he knocked his opponent out in K1, which is on a very short, which is yeah. K1 at his prime was the, like the highest level of striking. And he went in there short notice and knocked out a much bigger opponent. Yeah, so he's done some things. Obviously, he's not. Lucky he can't you know, blush. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky, you lucky he got off fast and he couldn't. He can't handle the African. You know? <laughs> so this is where the fight is going to take place up here. This is there. Yeah. This we is had there. a we had a little bit of condensation last night as the temperature changes, but you said as the lights come on, it'll probably uh, dry it up, right? So it will, it will make the surface warm. This is where you guys are going to be sitting, this right? This is our office for the night. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we have a monitor here that will be set up come by night and uh, our headphones. All right, let's do an audio check, boys. Let's hear, see how it sounds. Fight, fight fans, welcome to GCC Fight Night 883 brought to you by Friendship of Overseas Chinese, Chinese Association from our hundred nations. 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 <laughs> you gotta get it in one breath. Oh, honey. Oh, oh. 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 
All right, we're checking out a local craft beer bar here in uh, the south of Yunnan, which is quite interesting. Oh, they got some stuff on tap too. Look at that. Oh, look at this. This is where he is. Oh, what? What do you see? 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 Look at that. They, they knew it looks summer for three, and, and we got three of us here ready. For, very romantic. It's pretty good. Actually, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah. Usually, these tiny little places, especially small equipment like that, it's really hard to control the quality on, but that is good. I'm Von Anderson. And I'm Woody Bottiter. Tonight, we see two fighters from the Kazakhstan delegation making their debut in this car. Wait no longer here to kick off all the action is your master of ceremonies, Yang Guo. Yang Guo. That deserves a little bit of a <laughs> cheers there. Great work. You guys are going to kill it. So tradition says I need to make as many mistakes before the show. To get them all out of your system. Yeah. He doesn't seem too impressed with no, that No, 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 I give him a heart attack every time. Do you ever try to put yourself in the shoes of the locals? Like, these people coming into a bar on a Tuesday at 5 p.m. in like this part of the world, right? And we're here like screaming some like English open. I have a camera on us. But do, like it must, can you compare it like be somewhere like, have, and the like Saskatchewan, like Northern Saskatchewan? And there, there'd be like two Indian dudes with turbans on, like screaming in Hindi, uh, whatever language they speak there, right? Yeah, they'd be like, and it, we, you'd just be like, what's going on, right? Wait till you see this match, you guys. <laughs> Somebody gonna get hurt real bad. <laughs> Love All right, so it's going to start soon. I'm here on the stage next to the Lighters. two commentators uh, who are going to be doing the English commentating. Uh, Woody and uh, Anderson. Ron Anderson. But uh, people are starting to flow in. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of students up in the, uh, in the upper area there. But these, it'll be pretty entertaining because these local people probably have never in their life seen anything like this. I mean, I've never seen anything like this live, so it'll be pretty interesting to see their expressions. We got some medics on standby over here just in case there are any serious uh, injuries, rather. Um, and uh, obviously our two uh, commentators are practicing here, making sure they're ready for the show. This guy's washing down the room. Oh, I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we, we got some people in the building over there ready to watch the show. Free, no tickets needed. That's very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, over here too. All the students, there's lots of students here too, right? Is it because it's like something exciting that it's never seen before, so bring them out to see it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Everyone wants to see it. It's a small town, you know. On a scooter, like 30 minutes around the city. Yeah, yeah the, around the whole city. It's a small town. Yeah. But that, they have very nice uh, nightlife. They oh, yeah, pops. we noticed that. Yes. A yes. lot of people are on Monday night, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, it's amazing, guys. Right? Yeah. Oh, you enjoy their lives, you know. They, they know it's, how to party. It's a re and they're really friendly, too. <laughs> yeah. Future me coming at you from the editing room. Just to let you know, the rest of this video is only going to be a preview of the fights. The full fight video will come out at a later date. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And for now, enjoy the rest of the video.
Last weekend, I know this song. It's fucking. I don't ever wanna be you like I did that day. Take me to the place I love. Take me all the way. I don't ever wanna feel like I did that day. Take me to the place I love. Take me all the way. Yeah. 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 <laughs>